Hey everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, Chapter 4 lecture on C Sharp, which covers a wide range of topics. And so if you look at the title, Working with Number and String Data, we're, again, there's a lot of information in this chapter. Uh, it's very diverse in its nature, and so um, a lot to cover. And so uh, we've got all the objectives here that we're going to cover. Um, you know, hop over those and and just jump right in. And so the first thing that's covered in chapter four, luckily, is something that we've covered in a lecture prior to chapter four. We had to work with data types last week. And so we have covered data types um, already. There's a little bit more detail here that we did not cover in our prior lecture though. So I'm just gonna highlight um, the differences and then just review the stuff that we've already seen before. Um, let's go ahead and open up a new uh, project real quick and this will just be for coding demonstration purposes. We'll do a council app in the, uh, we'll just put this in the lab folder for chapter four. So we've already got a folder called CH4. So we're going to name our solution CH4. And we'll just call this demo one. Okay, so my little code demonstrations. Um, okay, so this question was actually asked last week. Um, it was asked in this in this case, a string name equals Bob versus string name two equals Chris. And the question was, what's the difference between the capital string and the lowercase string? And as we find out, they're aliases for one another. Um, so there's aliases for all the data types. And so the, the lowercase byte and the capital B-Y-T-E, um, one's a keyword um, that's built in. The lowercase keywords are always lowercase. And then one is a, a class that is an alias, and they call this uh, the .NET type, but it's, it's essentially a class. And if you remember back in our lecture, um, we, we learned that a uh, if, if you remember, a class is a blueprint of an object, if you remember that. And when you instantiate the class, you create the object. If you remember uh, the class, I referred to that as our cookie cutter, and then the cookie is our object. And then when you actually stamp the cookie cutter, that's creating an instance. You're creating an instance of an object. Um, and so all that just to say that these kind of, they basically do the same thing. Um, but because, because this exists, uh, we can do things like, because the lowercase byte, B-Y-T-E, is an alias for a class called byte, well, classes have methods. And so we can take our variable here. Typically, in, in some languages, okay, uh, let's just call out Java. Okay, in Java, when you have a, a data type like byte, okay, uh, in Java, it is not an alias for a class type byte. Okay, and what that means in Java is that your data types do not have methods. Um, but because in C sharp they are aliases for a class, all of our variables um, really are are objects, and because they're objects, they've got methods. Like you could do, um, you know, small number to string. Okay, and and what that does is it converts it to a string. Um, and then you could do some format specifiers like N3 or something like that. Point being that the important part here is that our variables 
have aliases, and because they have aliases, okay, they're actually objects, and because they're actually objects, they have methods that you can use. And you can look at those various methods um, when you use this dot notation. Okay, and so there's something called get hash code and equals and get type and two string. Really, um, probably the most common one you'll use here is two string. When you want to take a number and for whatever reason, that number you want to get it into a string format to do something with it. Okay, and so we'll we'll wind up doing that quite a bit. All right, so a lot of information right off the bat there that's important to know as you progress through this class that all of our all of our data types are actually objects and because they're actually objects they've got methods that that um, that you can use and it's not like that in other languages particularly Java in Java if you have a byte um, that byte does not have any methods that come along with it um, for free so to speak so you get some some free functionality out of your variables um, now we covered byte, short, ints, and longs. Um, remember that a byte is unsigned, but there also is a, a data type for s byte, which means a signed byte, which can go positive and negative. So in, in C sharp, there's s byte. Okay, so we're kind of getting down into the nitty gritty here. Um, you know, do we do we have eight bits that can store only positive numbers or do we have eight bits that can store positive and negative numbers you know if you add up all these values you get the same number of 256 values um, you know short well a short is inherently signed and a u short is unsigned so if you want just a positive short value you could do a u short okay we didn't really talk about those differences so that this is new these are data types that we did not cover. S byte, U short, U int. These are valid C sharp data types that were not covered last week. All right, keeping in mind that all of these uh, long and U long. So byte, shorts, ints, and longs, those are all considered integral data types. Integral data types meaning whole numbers. Okay, then we've got the good old floats and doubles. Okay, now, um, I'm going to kind of really um, give you uh, a short thing to read. Um, I'll, I'll post this article in, um, in the chat. Okay, you can kind of come back to this URL sometime. This is going to be a little bit deeper dive than is necessary in this class. Um, you kind of read, you know, I've been coding, you know, so this is a, a professional's blog and he's been doing this for a long time and he really ne never had to go into the nitty gritty between a float and a double or a decimal. Okay, so, um, you know, there are differences and this article goes down into the nitty gritty. And so I'll just kind of post this for your reference in the chat and you can kind of read that um, outside of this lecture, which is totally fine. Um, <clears throat> for the purposes of this lecture, um, though we're not gonna go down into nitty gritty. Floats and doubles, if you remember, I said seven diff digits of significant digits of a float. Blah, blah, blah and 14 significant digits of a, of a double. And so, you know, just keeping it kind of um, higher level for now, okay, you can get more information in that article. Um, again, a significant digit is before or after the decimal place. Um, so if you've got a lot of decimal places um, that are important, you might consider using a double over a float okay there's another d a data type that we did not talk about which is a decimal okay and a decimal uh, is 28 significant digits um, decimals though when, when it comes down to um, 
having the difference between a double and a decimal. Decimal is a better data type for, for your decimal places. So if you're looking to store a lot of decimal places, then you want to use a decimal. But if your whole number is a little bit larger, just kind of generically speaking, uh, you would consider putting that in a double. And that article kind of dives into that a little bit more. And we actually, we even do a lab over our data types. But a decimal is another data type that we did not cover last week um, that can be used to store um, floating point numbers, okay? Integral data types are whole numbers. Floating point numbers are decimal numbers. And the, the data types that are floating point numbers include float, double, and decimal. Okay, so, so the category is integral, meaning whole number, floating point numbers, which means they can store decimals. Okay, inside of the floating point number category, we've got floats, doubles, and decimal data types. And then we've got char and bool, and we've covered those before. Char is any character at the keyboard, bool is true or false. All right, uh, just a, a little bit of review here. Um, when it comes to creating variables, there's two steps. Uh, declare the variable and initialize the variable. Okay, so declare would be int And the initialize would be my value equals 123. All right, you can do both. You can do both at the same time. All right, the declaration when you declare your variable, you create the space in RAM, in your computer's RAM, you reserve the space in RAM, to hold a value. Remember that a variable is a named storage location in your computer's RAM. So when we have an int, you know, we've got 32 bits here that are being reserved in your computer's RAM to store a value. And then when you initialize it, your, initial, your initialization is the first time you store a value in a variable. Okay, so you initialize. The first time you store it in a variable is called the initialization. After that, you could just say you're assigning a value. So the init is the first assignment, and then any other time after that, you're just reassigning a value. Um, when you, this is done with the equal sign, um, and this is actually when this value, 123, is actually placed into the RAM um, to store, right? You're storing the value 123 in your computer's uh, random access memory, which is, you know, where where software runs. Your software runs out of RAM, right? Software, whether it's an operating system, whether it's uh, uh, Word, whether it's PowerPoint, whether it's uh, Discord, whether it's your favorite video game, all this software runs out of RAM. Um, because when anytime you create a variable, um, you're creating that space in RAM, and then you assign it, you're initializing it, you're putting values and storing them in RAM. Okay, we already have our naming conventions, uh, which is uh, camel notation, as I've demonstrated here. This is our naming convention. We've had some exercises where we practice our naming conventions for our variables. <clears throat>
you're gonna get a green squiggly here that says my value has never been used okay just because you initialize or assign a value that does not go away until you output that does not go away until you actually output that variable right so now notice, notice now that I've actually used that variable that green squiggly will go away okay so you don't have to worry about the green squiggly because ultimately you're you're you should use all of your variables if you don't use them they kind of warn you and say is this a kind of like a waste of space are you wasting memory here uh, if they're never used either either in output that's one way to use it or in some sort of equation in your math okay so here's examples how to declare and initialize now if I kinda come back here um, remember a rule of thumb is that data types on the left and right mu must match okay so if I say okay <clears throat> there's when you have integral data types C sharp Uh, I'm, I'm second guessing myself, that's why I'm pausing. Let's, let's talk about floating point types because uh, I'll come back to the integral. I'll come back to, to this. When it comes to floating point types, we've got decimal, doubles, and floats. So if I say double a number, that works. If I say decimal, that doesn't work. Same thing with float. So why does double work, but decimal does not, and float does not? Um, because what happens with our rule of thumb is that the left and right data types must match. So by default, C Sharp, the compiler, says, okay, well, I know what's on the left, and what I have on the right is a floating point number. Well, the compiler, when it has a floating point number, it has three options. It has to pick a data type. Okay, so the C sharp compiler looks at this number and it has to pick a data type. Um, that data type by default that it, it chooses is going to be a double every single time. So on the right hand side here, we've got this floating point number, but that is going to be treated as a double. Okay, because basically the compiler sees this floating point number and it sees a double. So what we have here is a double on the left and a double on the right. So that's why that works. Well, unfortunately, when you've got a decimal on the left, again, this is going to be a double on the right. And you can actually hold over this. It says... Um, it cannot implicitly convert a decimal which when okay so there's a, a keyword there imp cannot can't implicitly convert okay so when you see the word implicitly I just want you to think automatically 
it cannot automatically convert a double. Look, it actually says literal type of double. So what we have on the right hand side here is a double as I demonstrated here. So it says can't implicitly or automatically convert a double into a decimal. Can't implicitly convert a double into a decimal. All right, and hopefully you understand why. This is a double on the right, this is a decimal on the left. So some, some conversions Okay, because you've got different data types on the left and right. So what you have to do is you have to convert the data type to match. Some conversions can happen automatically, AKA implicitly. Okay, the opposite, the other type of conversion is called explicit. Okay, which means Implicit coding, uh, uh, imp bleh, implicit conversions happen automatically by the compiler. Explicit conversions, explicit conversions must be coded by you. Okay, they're explicit. You have to code them. So since it can't happen automatically, this conversion cannot happen automatically, we must explicitly convert line 36 and line 38. Okay. Um, yeah, Drew, I'm going to answer that in one, one quick answer here. So the way that we explicitly convert, there are many, there are many ways to explicitly convert okay one example is double dot parse okay that's that's an ex that's an explicit conversion okay but because this decimal thing happens so frequently instead of doing and I guess we could do decimal dot parse I don't typically do it this way so I think it's gonna work Actually, parse is going to be capital P. Yeah, still that doesn't work. Uh, oh, because that's got to be a string. The parse, that's why I don't normally do it this way. So how do we how do we actually do it? The decimal dot parse does not work. Why? It does not work because it actually needs to convert a string. This would actually have to be in quotes. Then that would be a string, and that would work. Okay, but but that's kind of that's that's kind of a weird hack. There's a much easier solution, and it even tells you on the error. It says um, use the capital letter M suffix to create a literal of this type. So if you do a capital M, and you kind of see the decimal, the M for decimal. Okay, now now we've got a decimal on the left and we've got a decimal on the right. The reason we have a decimal on the right is we take this double data type and we explicitly convert it by putting a capital letter M at the end of it. Okay, same thing here with the capital letter F or lowercase f, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so when it comes to our floating point numbers, these are how we store decimals, floats, and doubles. Okay. The question that was asked in chat, why why didn't they make the software to implicitly convert all of these? Like that would be nice. There is a reason why they didn't do that. Okay? And the reason why they they keep it this way, okay? Um there's two categories of conversions. Two categories of conversions. Widening conversions and narrowing conversions. Okay? The rule of thumb, the rule of thumb is that widening conversions happen implicitly. Narrowing conversions 
uh, happen explicitly. Okay, widening conversions are when you take something like a float, which had seven digits of precision of, you know, a float is 32 bits. Um, whereas a double uh, is, I believe, more bits. Let me double check myself. Yeah, eight bytes, 32 bits. Double is eight bytes or 64 bits. So a double is 64 bits. So when you're adding, adding more space to your conversion, meaning you're adding more potential uh, storage, um, the widening conversions, in other words, happen automatically because all you're doing is you're adding more space to store the number. So widening conversion says, okay, you've got this small container and we're going to convert it into a bigger container. You know, so, so you're not at risk of losing information. Now I want you to think of some big number that's stored in a big container and then you're going to try and store it in a smaller container. Okay, well what could happen there, like think of, like literally think of like storage units. If you've got a big storage unit with a bunch of st of your stuff in it, right? And you're going to downgrade it uh, to a smaller storage unit, um, you might potentially have to lose some information. Uh, you might have to cut some stuff. So these narrowing conversions, when they go from a wider storage unit into a narrower storage unit, they happen explicitly because there is a potential that data could be lost in the narrowing conversion. So narrowing conversions are considered risky, okay? Narrowing conversions, narrowing conversions are kind of risky because of the potential data loss. Okay, so let's even think about this float. So on the right, we've got a, we said this is a double. We said a double is 64 bits. So we've got 64 bits to store this number, and we're going to cram it into a narrowing 32-bit storage unit, right? So we've got this potential 64-bit worth of number here, and we're going to store it in a 32-bit storage container. Therefore, that's a narrowing conversion, and you could lose data that way. Okay, and because you could lose data that way, they're going to force you to say, yes, I know what I'm doing. I want this number to be a float. And, and they, they do that by adding the F on, on the right. Drew, does that, does that make sense? It's a winded explanation. But, but did it kind of make sense? Okay, it made sense to Drew have no idea if it made sense to the other 19 of you. Um, can, can you guys chime in a little bit? Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so keeping in mind, okay, so that was, let's look at decimal. Notice that a decimal is also 16 bytes. which is interesting. We got four bytes, eight bytes, 16 bytes. Now, now, most of the time when you do explicit conversions, it's gonna be because of a narrowing conversion. Most of the time. What's a little bit intriguing to me, if you're paying attention, you might say, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, this is a widening conversion. A decimal is 16 bytes. Most of the time when you do an explicit, it's because of narrowing conversions. But if you look here at the decimal, we've got a decimal on the right, a double on the left, I should say, a double on the left, but we have to explicitly convert it to a decimal. But that's because decimal is just kind of a unique data type. Um, because of the way that a decimal works, this is a rare case. This is a rare case where 
um, we still have to do an explicit conversion, even though um, this this data type on the right is a is a double, and we're converting it up a widening conversion into a decimal. Normally, normally this would happen automatically, but because decimal is pretty unique in in how it works, um, because it's really good at storing large decimal points. Um, they still want you to explicitly convert it. Um, let's let's go and talk a little bit about integral data types. Okay, so um, so I believe again when you when you look at byte. Um, Short int long. You really don't have that problem over here where you need to do any sort of um, explicit conversions. All of these um, don't really run that risk of narrowing conversions. Um, <clears throat> so you don't really run into that problem where you have to put the the explicit conversion into it. Now, this is why I was kind of hesitating. Um, based on everything I would explain, you would assume that the you got you know on the right hand side. Um, I think the the compiler looks at this this number on the right, and I, I believe it assigns it a long data type. Um, let me look at the long. Now that's eight bytes. Eight times eight is sixty-four, so it's sixty-four bits. Um. So I, I believe the default is going to be a long. Um, that way everything here is a narrowing conversion. Um, but I'm a little hesitant on that. I want to double check myself. I, I might be wrong on that, which there might be some further explanation needed if, if it's not. Um, but I just wanted to simply show you that there's no explicit conversions needed on these integral data types. The explicit conversions are only needed on these floating point data types. Okay. So all that fun stuff, we've covered all that. Um, real, real quickly, just remember that a char is always in single quotes and a string is always in double quotes. Now, in the textbook, their, their naming conventions for constant um, is different than mine. I always use all caps with underscores. Okay. So, again, we've got... We've got examples of our naming conventions, which words and more words is camel casing. Okay, so for all of our variables, we're using camel casing. Okay, if you don't do this, you will miss, you know, points throughout this class, right? So your variables will need to remain camel casing, and there, there's essentially, you know, penalties for not doing that because naming conventions are important. Uh, in fact, you know, many companies. Uh, have very strict naming convention standards. Okay, so being able to follow naming conventions uh, is important in your code. Um, when another type of casing is Pascal, which is not this, Pascal casing is like uh, our methods would be public void 
do something. Uh, and this would have to be declared outside of the main method. Notice we're all inside of these quotes inside of main. If we're going to write our own method, we have to declare it outside of main. Um, point being, this is Pascal casing. And so in this class, our methods are going to be Pascal casing. Our um, constants are just going to be all caps. And then our variables are going to be camel casing most of our variables we'll learn we'll learn later some scenarios where other variables uh, do some different things okay um duh, 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 duh. we already know that we can do some math um we had a hands-on test where we were doing some math uh one thing as a review that we didn't hit very hard um is this modulus which is not in your typical math class. So I like to cover modulus at least once. Um, modulus is also known as the remainder. And so you go back to your um, go back to your early math classes when you learn what the remainder is, when you take uh, when you take 10 divided by 3, you know, for example, 10 divided by 3 uh, is 3 with a remainder of 1, right? So, so when I do, when I replace the division with a percent symbol, what we're actually doing is we're trying to extract the remainder. Like, we don't really care about the whole number that goes into it. We're just trying to extract the remainder. Okay, so 10 modulus 3, this is just a programming tool that we have to solve some problems, and it's actually kind of a useful tool at times to solve some problems. Um, you know, we're going to get the remainder of 1. So here we get the remainder of 1. If I do 11 modulus 3, uh, it, 3 goes into 11 three times with a remainder of 2. So we're going to get the remainder of 2. Okay, So we will use all of these uh, arithmetic operators to do some math, to solve some problems. I demonstrated um, you know, increment and decrement operations. Specifically, we did an exercise with prefix versus postfix. Um, so we saw how we can increment values and decrement values. Okay, we did a whole lot of exercise around just doing this. Okay, that was actually on last Friday where we, we learned about prefix and postfix notation. Okay, you could definitely read through the chapter and make sure that you follow and you understand um, why these answers are what they are. Okay, last little thing before a break. Okay. Um, are these shorthand operators. Um, kind of come back into this. We're gonna, I'll ask some questions and then we'll take a break. Um, very commonly, um, in coding, we take value and let's say, let's say 10 represents your month, right? So let's just say the month is the 10th month of the year, which is, uh, I believe, October. And we want to, okay, October rolls over into November. So we have to take the month of 10 and increase it by 1. So the way that we would write that in code equals something like this. Month equals month plus 1. And the way that this is this is new in, in programming, your math class doesn't write write it like that. Um, but this is a, the equivalent of saying the updated month is assigned the current month plus one. So the updated month 
is assigned the current value, which is 10, plus 1. So after executing line 68, of course, this takes the month to 11, which represents November. Okay, so this is, this is as a new programmer, you probably want to code it like this um, in the beginning because this is a little bit easier to understand as you're, as you're new. Um, but there's a shorthand, a shorthand for doing this, for coding, for coding the same thing, which is month plus equals one. So month, line 68 could be replaced with a shorter month plus equals one. So line 68 and line 69 do the same thing, which they increase month by one. Okay, well, of course, if you wanted to increase it by two, like October changes to December, you could say month equals month plus two or month plus equals two. Line 68 and line 69 do the same thing. And you can do this with more than just addition. You could say month equals month minus three or month minus equals three. Month equals month times three or month times equals three, right? These are all shorthand for doing a longer notation in code. All right, I'm gonna go back to the top. We're gonna ask some questions and we're gonna take a break. All right, um, what is it called? And I'm asking Discord and so you can just answer in Discord. What is it called when you reserve a variable in RAM? What is that called when you reserve a variable's location in RAM? That's the variable declaration. What's it called the first time when you put a value inside of a variable? You initialize, you initialize, okay? You, you initialize. Now, couple different answers there. So the first time, the first time is called the initialization. The first time you store a value in a variable. Okay, so initialize. Now, initializing is also assigning, but it's a specific time of assignment. It's the first time that you assign. Okay, so when you initialize a variable is the first time that you put a value in it. Any time after that, it's simply assigning. Okay, it's done with the equal sign or this equal sign is also called the assignment operator. Okay, now another term there is instantiate. What is instantiating? This actually goes back to um, last chapter, but what is instantiating? Yes, instantiating, instantiating is creating an object out of the class. So again, this is kind of going back a chapter. What is a class? How would you define a class? A blueprint for an object so so a class is a blueprint for an object good um, and what is an object I haven't really got into what an object is okay it's a very vague thing maybe I did did, did I cover what an object is in a prior lecture it's a very vague kind of definition. An object is just a, a software implementation of a real world thing. Okay. 
an object is a real world thing in software. Yeah, so if you look at Dylan, an object is a unit like a control. So one, one object would be a button, okay? A button is a real world thing, but it's the software implementation of, of this button in the real world, okay? Um, a person could be an object, right? Uh, a cup could be an object. A student could be an object. A teacher could be an object. So typically objects are nouns. Um, so if, if you want to remember that, that's a good way of remembering objects are typically nouns. But it's like the software implementation of a real world noun, person, place, or thing. Awesome. Okay, back to this lecture. Um, what are the two types of conversions that happen um, in coding? Implicit and explicit. Which one is um, which one is coded by by a developer? Which one is coded by the developer? Yeah, the explicit. The explicit does not happen automatically. Therefore, the one that does happen automatically is implicit. Okay. Basically, some conversions will happen automatically for you. Some conversions will not. Like the more dangerous conversions will not happen automatically. Okay, but if it's a, if it's a fairly safe conversion, um, then it will happen automatically. Okay, that's the rule of thumb. Um, we introduced a new data type that can hold floating point numbers. What's our new data type that we had not covered before? decimal and if we look at decimal the important thing about decimal is it's a really big storage unit okay um, it's the only one that is 16 bytes okay look at all of these how many bytes okay so it's a really big storage unit uh, 16 times 8 is, um, and and it can store, t because it's such a big storage unit, it can store 28 significant digits, okay? Whereas a, um, a double can store approximately 14 significant digits, digits, and a float is approximately 7. So the question is asked, does it risk slowing down the program if you use it a lot? No. I describe it as a big storage unit, but we have so much RAM. Um, there are scenarios in the real world where your data types matter. The data types really used to matter. Like I remember Bill Gates, Bill Gates would talk about like back in his day, data types were really important um, because because you could preserve memory you could save memory but now I mean you can have 16 gigs of RAM on your computer and when you're talking about bytes okay um, you know 8 bits is a byte um, a thousand bytes is a kilobyte. Um, a thousand kilobytes is one megabyte. A thousand megabytes is one gigabyte. So eight bits is a byte. A thousand bytes is a kilobyte. 1,000 kilobytes is a megabyte, and 1,000 megabytes is a gigabyte. So when we're talking about, we're talking about 64 bits, 64 bits is such a small amount 
to the gigs and gigs that we have 64 bits uh, for a double a uh, decimal it's still basically insignificant when it comes to how much RAM we actually have because I don't know if you look at your computer you might have 16 gigabytes of RAM right and as time goes on it's more and more common you might have 32 gig of RAM you might have 64 I've seen computers with hundreds of gigs of RAM 128 gigabytes of RAM you know I, I don't even know maybe maybe they make computers like desktop computers with more than that uh, I've seen servers with more than that yeah it does sound excessive Okay, um, now, Drew, to your question, you know, so are you saying the data types don't matter, Mr. G? You're teaching us all these differences of data types, and now you're saying they kind of don't matter. No, they do matter. Um, there are scenarios where working with specific data types and working with the, the most efficient data type does matter. Um, but in this class, for the most part, I mean, in this class, to be honest, um, you know, if you're working with a whole number, you're probably working with an int. If you're working with a floating point number, you probably just work with a double or a decimal. You know, these are fine. For the most part, if you're working with a name, you're working with a string. You know, you can get by in this class mostly working with strings, ints, and doubles. Um... I could think of a lot of real world examples, you know, in databases and in these different scenarios, like you get these small devices without a lot of RAM, like uh, remote controls, you know, everything's a computer nowadays. A com remote control for your television can be a computer in itself with RAM and hard drive space and et cetera, et cetera. So you get these small devices like remote controls that really need to preserve memory. Um, but even these small devices, because it's so cheap nowadays, can have a lot of memory. Okay. Let's see if there's any other questions for review. Um, what is uh, what is the percent symbol used for? What is a percent symbol used for in our equations? Yeah, it's called modulus. What what does it give us? Yeah, it's essentially the remainder. Yeah, it's the remainder. Not like in a decimal format. It's not like 0.333 remainder, but in the whole number remainder. A whole number remainder. Um, what's the casing for our variables? What kind of um, naming convention do we use? We use camel. And then uh, for our methods, we use what? What kind of? Yeah, it's called Pascal casing. And then for our constants, we just use all caps. Um, <clears throat> order of operations is still a thing. So please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. You can do all of that on the right-hand side of your equal sign, right? So I consider that a prerequisite to this class. You must know order of operations um, in order to kind of uh, know what happens first. Now, okay, I call it a prerequisite. They do explain it in the book. So if you need help on reviewing the order of operations, uh, I, I can help. You know, I'm not going to, like, leave you out in the wind, you know, stranded if, if you need a review of uh, order of operations. But they go through and they talk about, you know, order of operations. Right? They go into a little bit more detail on how implicit casting works. Generally, you see this here. What they're doing is they're upcasting. Upcasting, meaning from smaller data type, can automatically can be converted up into a larger data type right so generically speaking that's that's what you're looking at when you're looking at this this slide is upcasting or widening conversions okay explicit casting um, can happen 
as such. Now, I'm going to give you a break after here. I'm just going to, I just want to get a few more slides in. But uh, if you look at this first example, int grade equals, you notice what we have here is a double on the right, 93.75. If you explicitly cast that, this is what I'm talking about, is that you can lose data. Grade will just hold the number of 93. Grade will chop off, or what they call truncating, um, the, the 0.75. It'll chop off the, the decimal place. Okay, that's that's why you have to explicitly cast um, sometimes because you run the risk of losing data. In this point, in this example, they lose the 0.75. All right, it's a good place for a break. We're right uh, at a good stopping point, so I'm going to pause. All right, we left off here on uh, slide 22, and um, you know they cover some built-in uh, methods built into C sharp uh, that help you do a lot of common math um, uh, math equations if you will so we're looking at the the method for example here is the round method uh, you could take a number to a power so you could say math dot pow math is the class dot pow is the method so the math class math dot round a number into precision so you know when we're rounding a lot of times there's a, there's many ways of rounding one way of rounding is math.round um, we can also use those format specifiers that, that I showed on the hands-on test where you could say like n3 um, and so again there's multiple ways of rounding but here there's some built-in methods math.pow you know, so if I say, do, 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 just demonstrate this, and we can use math.pow. We take a number like 3 to the second power, so 3 times 3 gives you the value of 9, right? And then you say 3 to the third power gives you 27 so on and so forth. So math.pow takes a base number and takes it to a power. Um, math.square root, you can use math.square root, the square root of 25, gives us a value of five, so on and so forth. They use a bunch of um, demonstrations, math min and max methods um, so the max will look at the two values and return the the larger of the two of course the min does the opposite so a bunch of different examples using the math class and various methods that are built in now something of note here um, One thing that we've learned about classes so far, we haven't learned a lot about classes, but we know that um, you can create objects out of classes. And so um, what, what I didn't have to do here is actually do that. I did not have to create an object. So to create an object, and this probably won't even work, I did not have to do this. And then say math variable dot sqrt. Okay, so when I'm looking here, I say this is a math class, and you say, wait a minute, with a math class, don't I create objects? You might remember the syntax of creating an object from a math class. Um, and the answer is sometimes to work with methods inside of a class. To work with methods in a class, sometimes you use class name dot method name notation. Other times you create a variable and 
use variable name dot method name. Okay, so this is an example where you use class name dot method name to work with a method that's inside of a class. Other times, we'll have to create a variable and then use the, the variable dot method name to work with a class. And, and kind of the reason behind that is how these methods were created. Um, this method was created in such a way that you could use class name dot method name. Um, other methods will be created differently where you have to create an instance variable first. And so um, just pointing that out is that we do have this syntax. Um, oftentimes, um, methods that can be used in class name dot method name format are often called utility methods because they are easy to code and use. Um, you know, they're, they're easy to utilize, you know, and build into your code. So this square root method is called a utility method um, because it's just so easy, easily accessible through the name of of the of through the class which is the math class okay um of course that doesn't work cuz basically cuz the square root method was was created in such a way that you just directly access it through the class name all right um, back to a little bit more information on strings. More, more strings. Okay. Uh, strings can be empty. Empty string. Now it's called an empty string, but in reality, it's it's an empty string is still a value. And now the value is called an empty string, but it is something. Um, null is different than an empty string. Uh, null is kind of like um, this is a value, an empty string is a value. Null is to say that um, like the lack of a value completely. Null means no value, uh, nothing exists inside of name two. So null is different than an empty string. In fact, there's a method called is null or empty. And you could put that inside of an of an if statement to see if it's either one to to test if it's null, which is this, or whether it's empty. And the variable that we're testing is name, so we should get name is null or empty. Okay, um, so same thing here. This would work on name two. Name is still null or empty. Um, Otherwise, if I actually put a value in here and then I test name three against this, name has a value. So this is a really useful uh, utility method. Now that you know what a utility method is, this utility method belongs to the string class and you can test it to see if something is null or empty. 
And because we're testing name three here, name has a value, so we should in fact see that name has a value. So that's a nice little utility method. We haven't talked about if else's, but you can kind of get the gist of it. Um, they got a funny word when it comes to strings, string concatenation. Concatenation means adding strings together. String full name equals first name plus last name. Okay, now what you're going to get here is you're going to get Bob Smith added together and stored in full name. Um, there's not going to be a space between the two, which is something that beginner programmers kind of often struggle with. Is like, wait a minute, I want it to be Bob Space Smith. Um, because what we have here are what are called string literals. These are values, literals are values that are coded into the software. And so if you want to add a space, you can add it right there. Or alternatively, you could add it right there. So you really got to kind of hard code the space in. And you get your name Bob Smith. So that's concatenation, just adding strings together. Um, that's fairly common. Um, you could add a string and a number, but what you do is interesting, right? So let's say, let's say uh, double age equals Bob is 13, full name with age plus age, full name with age. You can see Bob Smith 13. It's got it needs a space here after Smith, right there. So we add Bob Smith 13. Now, interesting. Let's look at that. On the right hand side, we've got a string plus a string plus a double. Uh, you might think, well, what's happening here, you know, is a implicit conversion. When you add strings to a number, double age is 13. Uh, we got an implicit conversion going on here and it's taking this double and converting it into a string. So you got a string on the right hand side, this winds up being a string and on the left you got a string. So um, again, some conversions happen automatically and when you add a number to a string, that's an implicit conversion it happens automatically. You can do plus equals um, just like you can with math instead of saying um, you could say first name plus equals last name and that will append uh, the last name onto the first name variable in which case you would re <laughs> you'd need to rename that it just wouldn't be his first name anymore. Um, escape sequences, these are ways to, um, like for example, you could do Bob backslash N, and that will cause a new line after the first name. And so if I look at this, now it's Bob, and then it causes a line break. And then we got Smith, in which case we wouldn't have to put, you could do like a tab, a couple tabs. Right, so we got a couple tabs in there. So these are just ways to format your output, um, these escape sequences. So I'll, I'll just add that escape sequences start with a backslash and can help us format our output. Uh, again, real world case scenario, case scenario would be for um, receipts. 
I before E except after C. Receipts. So those are escape sequences, right? And they and and what you do is you know escape sequences. Um, you insert them in your string literals. Okay. So again, string literals are just values that you have coded in in your source code. They're your strings that you have coded in your source code. String literals. Um, sometimes, um, if you want to provide a path on your computer, and this is a Windows PC. So if I look at a Windows PC, um, let me go to Like this is my this is my path that I just have copied and pasted. So if I was going to put that in a string, uh, eventually you might start working with files on your computer. So you might want to say string uh, path equals c colon, and then for a for a backslash, because keep in mind a backslash is your escape sequence. So to get a backslash is backslash backslash. So for every single backslash, you need to put two inside of your uh, string literals. Now there is another way. Um, you put an at symbol, and that's what they show here in, in front of your path, and then that way you don't have to put two backslashes every time. It's just kind of uh, these are two ways of doing the same thing all right we there is a string class I kind of showed that off a little bit earlier with this uh, utility method um, there's also a, a generic object class. All right, we'll hit that a little bit later in the class. Um, there is a generic object. Uh, some common methods here to string. Uh, I showed that earlier when I took a I took a double data type and I converted it to a string. Um, Parse, we've covered parse many times. And then there's try parse. Try parse is an interesting try parse is an interesting method. Sometimes you get like an input inside of a string. So maybe the user typed at the keyboard one, two, three dot three four. And there's a try parse method that accepts a string. And if it works, um, I'm going to call this, um, call it good value. Um, there's a lot going on right here uh, in all this code. Um, so I'm going to store what the user types council. Okay. Let me show you. Let me show you why try parse is useful. 
right now, we all know how to do this. Um, we all know how to ask the user for a number and then store that number inside of a double. And if I say 12.3, the program continues, it does not crash. And I'll just say, okay, so we spit the number back out at the user. But right now, try parse. If I say, and you guys will do this if you ask for a double, and what happens if you accidentally type a letter? By the way, do users always give you the input that you're looking for? Of course they don't. So users will do this, and what happens in a command line or in a council is that this is a crash. Okay, it even tells you, hey, I. I don't know what to do with this. The input was not in a correct format. It was expecting a number, but you gave it a letter. So what the user typed, that's the input string, was not in a correct number uh, format. It was not in a correct format. It couldn't convert the letter into a number. So it crashes your program. Okay, now, now this is useful regardless of whether you're doing GUIs or whether you're doing console. So instead of accepting input like this, which is what we've been doing, we're going to learn a different way to do um, triparse. I'll call it user string and we'll just read the we'll just read the string. We'll create a variable called good value. And the user string goes into our try parse. You can actually, believe it or not, you can put this in an if statement. And if this works, if the user input can be converted into a double, it will store that double in good value. So if the conversion works, then we'll spit it out. And by spit it out, it'll be in good value. Conversion worked. And it's in good value. Else, uh, conversion didn't work. Sad face. Now the difference here, when you say conversion didn't work, um, you know you could reprompt the user for that input until they give you a good input. And so instead of just saying it didn't work, you could, as we get into this class, you know you learn ways to reprompt the user. Um, so let's check this out. So now if I enter a double, oh why why didn't it work? Because I entered a slash. Twelve slash two conversion didn't work. That's what I would expect. But if I say 12.2, now it says conversion worked and 12.2 is inside of a, at this point, 12.2 is now stored in a double. Correct. So if you kind of, if I would have explained this correctly, I would have said, hey class, Here's a new way of doing, a better way of doing data validation than we've done so far. Because so far we haven't done any data validation, meaning making sure the end user is giving you the data that you're asking for. Now this is a utility method, this triparse. It belongs to the class of double. 
Keep in mind, lowercase double and a capital double are, you, are aliases for one another. So the triparse method that belongs to the double class. So that's triparse. Um, there is a convert class, um, which can be used for converting data types. Um, but remember, I, I prefer, you know, when I'm converting data types, I just prefer um, double dot parse. I found double dot parse to be usable in more scenarios. Um, so over here, you could do double dot parse, or as I demonstrated last week, convert to double. Okay, so these are two methods convert to double or double dot parse. And again, I've found double dot parse to be more uh, usable and, and I've, I've come across a couple scenarios where I wanted to convert a string into a double and uh, convert to double wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, working for me. So, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> kind of covered all of this information on that slide. Uh, formatting codes. The main thing here, formatting is currency, formatting is a number, uh, formatting as percent. Let's kind of do that. That's kind of cool. So if I take that number and I format it as a percent, keep in mind, 1% or one, the number one is 100%. So, so the number 12, uh, 1200, uh, let's see. So we get a, a 1220%. So when you format as a percent, again, keeping in mind one is 100%. So the number 12.2 is 1,220%. Um, so you have to take a number like, you know, 0.5, of course, will give you then, 0.5 will give you 50.0%. So that's your format specifier for percent. So you can use all of these format specifiers um, inside of a two string. So if you take a decimal dot two string is another way of getting it to a currency. Um, but I, you could just do this and that works. Um, what they're saying is you could say number dot two string and that does the same thing. Um, but actually we're gonna put these in single quotes. Um, Nope, it's not liking my, yeah, I think that works. Yeah, it's just Visual Studio made it look a little strange. So 50 cents in currency, 0.5 is 50 cents in currency. Again, you could take the number, convert it to a string. Well, why does it have to be converted to a string? Well, what is it adding for us? It's adding in, it's adding in a dollar sign. It might add in some commas. So to have those symbols, you need that to be a string. All right, one last concept 
and then I think we're pretty much done with this lecture because it's really, really boiling down here. Um, so, you know, if you're kind of zoning out because we're covering a lot of basics and there's a lot. I mean, there's no doubt there's a lot of information here. So I understand it's been a long lecture. If I'm looking at this, it's over an hour and a half. Uh, if you include the breaks. Um, so I want you to zone back in for me because I've got one last topic and you're going to need to pay attention to this. Uh, let's see. The variable, the, the, the topic is variable scope. Scope is something in coding. I once had a programming student that said, you know, it's this, you know, think of it in the real world. Sometimes if you remember it in the real world, you can remember like what it equates to in programming, even though they have no equivalence whatsoever, right? In the real world, scope is the stuff that makes your breath smell good. Okay, in programming has nothing to do with your breath. Okay, in programming, scope refers to the parts of a program that can access your variables. Variables are considered in scope or out of scope. In scope variables. mean that they are accessible to that area of your code. Out of scope variables means that they are not accessible to that area of your code. Okay, I wrote a whole lot of code here, but if I look I can collapse that. I could see that everything that I wrote is inside of main. It's main is a method. Remember methods have parentheses. So we've got two methods inside of this program. I've got one method called main. I've got another method called do something. I just heard my kid fall. Uh, back to scope. I was expecting her to cry, but she didn't. Two methods so far. You notice I've got something called my value. That's the first variable that I've declared inside of main. So I've got something called my value. Let's see if I go down here and I start to type my value equals. You can see here that it says my value does not exist out of scope. This method called do something does not have access to the my value variable. It was declared inside of main. So its scope then is local, local scope to the main method. So my value can be used anywhere in here anywhere in main, like down here towards the end, I could set my value equals one, two, three. Okay, so the scope of a variable that's declared inside of a method is local to that method, which what that means is it's not accessible, it's out of scope in other methods. So local scope means a variable was declared in a method and is only in scope inside of that method. Okay, I'm actually gonna cut that and I'm gonna paste it. Um, Cause right here I talk about local scope to the main method. Local scope means variable was declared in a method and is only in scope inside of that method.
Now, another kind of scope. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about those keywords, Drew, like public, private, protected, all that stuff. That's all. It doesn't hurt right now to make the main method public, but um, we'll, we'll get to that. I, that's, that's a good question. So what if you want a variable to be accessible or in scope in multiple methods? Well, then you declare it at the class level. You notice this is a class and I've got the curly braces for my class right here. Now I'm not inside of a method. Now I'm inside of the class and I could say double some user input and then I can access it here inside of main oh it's gonna give me a problem and I know why don't worry about this keyword now um, da, 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 da. static double not do static double Some user input equals, because main is static, I have to mark this as static. Now I can access it here. And I'm also gonna have to make this method static, public static void do something. Don't worry about this keyword static for now. Point is, I can access my variable in both methods. Some user input equals something else right now. Okay, um, a common place where you need to do this is on your GUI programs. Let me, let me do a GUI, add a new project, Windows Form Application, Demo 2, GUIs didn't go away. GUIs are coming back. We're going to be using GUIs more this week. All right, I've got a button one click here, and I've got a button two click here. These are both methods, All right? Button one click is a method, button two click is a method. If I want a variable to be in scope in both of these methods, I need to declare it at the class. So here I could say double. Now notice I didn't have to type the keyword static here. Double some number. And then here, some number is accessible. And here, some number is accessible. Okay, so variable scope, when I say it's accessible, the variable's in scope. If you declare a variable inside of a method, it's said to have local scope, and it's only accessible in that method. If you declare a variable at the class, it's said to have class scope or accessible inside of the class, but because methods are inside of the class, it's accessible to all the methods. So that's a summary of all that stuff that that says. All right, uh, I'm gonna hold off. It's been a long lecture. Um, there are a couple more topics. I'm gonna put them just in a separate video. I'm just gonna cover these because it's, it's, this has been long enough. I'm gonna stop the, uh, the lecture for today and I'll finish this up maybe tomorrow. Okay, there are a couple more concepts, but I'm um, gonna go ahead and stop the recording.